All right, so this past week we were talking about blood, right? This amazing fluid, we looked at the components, the plasma, solutes, proteins uh, that are dissolved in that aqueous part of blood. We talked about the formed elements, platelets, red blood cells, white blood cells, right? So we, I think, have a pretty good understanding of anatomy, and we talked a little bit about function as well, right? Doing things like transporting substances, gases, nutrients, wastes, right? Um, a little bit about how the blood is able to help defend the body from pathogens, how the blood actually contains the ability to stop bleeding, this kind of auto-regulation to prevent fluid loss, um, and even things like how blood can maintain body temperature um, or the pH um, of the system. So the thing is, we have this amazing fluid that's capable of doing lots of things, um, but we need it to actually be able to move around in the body. And so that's where the rest of this cardiovascular system comes into play. Now, if you look at the term cardiovascular, cardio should make you think heart, right? So that's referring to the pump of this system. And then vascular are the blood vessels, which we'll get into uh, in the next chapter, the tubes that need to carry our fluid blood throughout the body. Today we're going to focus in on the pump, which is, of course, the heart. Now, the heart is actually two pumps side by side, right? So the right side of the heart acts as one pump and the left side of the heart acts as the other, but because they're together in the same organ, those two pumps work in unison, and we'll kind of look at why that's important. Couple things here uh, to keep in mind with these two pumps. You need to get used to this idea that you're talking about, maybe you got this in AMP1, your patient's right side, your patient's left side. So right side of the heart, left side of the heart. Um, the right side of the heart is what we call the pulmonary circuit. This pump is actually pushing blood to, to the lungs, sorry, here we go, to the lungs and then that oxygenated blood comes back to the heart. That's the pulmonary circuit. Now the left pump, the left side of the heart, is going to pump blood to what they're calling the systemic circuit, right? The rest of the body, right? Up to the brain, down to the toes, everything in between. Let's take a look at some of the anatomy in the heart. Now in lab this week, you will be dissecting hearts. I think you might have cow hearts. Um, which are pretty fun so that you can see all these structures. But let's start to get an idea of what we're dealing with. Now, this can get pretty complicated, particularly as you're first learning the anatomy. So I typically draw it as a much simpler structure. I just draw it as like a little rectangle here. And we can start thinking about uh, the chambers, the, the um, valves, in the heart and all this. So if we look at the heart, right, there's four chambers, two on the top, two on the bottom. These top two chambers are the atria. Right? You have a right atrium and a left atrium. Right? So atria is plural, atrium is singular, and atrium is like an entryway. So maybe in a fancy house or like a botanical garden or something, you have this entryway. And so in fact, these two chambers are the receiving areas of the heart. So here in the right atrium, we actually see blood flow coming in through the superior and inferior vena cava, and also through what's called this, this opening to the coronary sinus, this is where the blood that actually feeds the heart muscle is coming back in. So if you wanted to add these onto your drawing, right, you could have blood coming in a superior vena cava and an inferior vena cava. Uh, the opening of the coronary sinus is gonna be a little bit harder, but maybe we'll make a little list. So the right atrium, again, it's the, the entryway, the receiving chamber, blood from, the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, and the coronary sinus. Okay. 
the left atrium, I'm not, I can't draw all of it, but here we see um, the vessels coming back from the lungs, um, and these are the pulmonary veins. And what I've drawn here, there's two pulmonary veins coming from the left lung, but what I'm not drawing are the two pulmonary veins coming from the right lung. That would get super complicated, but again, the left atrium receives blood from the pulmonary veins. Ooh. This is something that often throws students. I think we learned somewhere along the way that arteries carry oxygenated blood and veins carry deoxygenated blood. It's not true. Arteries carry blood away, artery away from the heart. But notice the arteries from the right hand side, they're actually carrying deoxygenated blood to the lungs, right? So pulmonary arteries are carrying deoxygenated blood. It's away from the heart. The pulmonary veins, look how bright red they are, full of oxygen from the lungs, pulmonary veins. So veins return blood to the heart, arteries carry it away, okay? All right, so those are our atria, our entryways. Now the lower two chambers here are the ventricles. Sorry, that's an N, ventricles. Now, this root, venter, if you think about, so we talk mostly about like anterior, posterior, but in a four-legged animal, we tend to use the terms dorsal and ventral, right? The underbelly. The underbelly is the vent. Uh, so ventricle here um, refers to these lower two chambers. Again, a right ventricle, I'm going to abbreviate, and a left ventricle. And these are the actual pumps, right? This is, notice how much more muscle is down here than we see um, up in the atria. These guys give a little squeeze to kind of top off the ventricles, but the ventricles truly are the pump. Now on the right side of the heart, we're going to get that blood uh, from the right atrium down into the ventricle, right, through a little valve. We'll talk about that in a minute. This right ventricle then pumps blood out through the pulmonary trunk, pulmonary arteries. This gets difficult to draw. Bear with me. Um, let's do over here. The right ventricle. Pushes blood to pulmonary trunk, which then splits into the pulmonary, it's away from the heart, so it's the pulmonary arteries, right, and then to the lungs, right, because that's what pulmonary is referring to. The left ventricle <laughs> is going to pump blood out the aorta into the entire system. Right, to the rest of the body. Again, this gets kind of difficult to draw. Maybe we'll just add it to our list here. The left ventricle pumps blood to the aorta, which is our biggest artery, and then onto the whole body rest of the systemic circuit. Okay, um, so we have two pumps here, ah, side by side. What I want to point out, so here's maybe a better look at that, kind of a cross section of the heart is really trying to show you the difference, particularly in the musculature of the right and the left ventricle. The right ventricle, since it's pumping to the lungs, the lungs are right next door, right? So it actually does not exert a lot of pressure to move the blood there. The left ventricle on the other side, other hand, has to go to the whole body. And so it's actually, they pump pretty much the same volume of blood with every beat, 
but that left ventricle is going to be working about five times as hard, right? It has to push against much more uh, resistance, more friction and whatnot um, in those blood vessels, okay? So this is what it looks like when the atria and the ventricles work together. So this is what we call the cardiac cycle, right, which is just a full uh, rotation of who's contracting, who's relaxing. And so these are some terms that you need here, systole and diastole. And you're already familiar with this if you know about blood pressure, right? So we talk about blood pressure as systolic over diastolic. Systole, that systolic term, is referring to the pressure when a chamber is contracted, right, exerting force. And then this smaller number is when there's not as much effort, when that is actually in relaxation. So what we're going to see here is we're going to see periods of time when the atria is contracting and the ventricle is relaxed, and periods of time when the ventricle is contracting and the atria is relaxed, those sorts of things, right? So this is going to be our full cardiac cycle. Let's just take a quick peek at what this looks like from start to finish. So up here, we're starting. We're saying atrial systole, the atria contract and kind of top off the blood uh, into the ventricles. Notice this outer ring is telling you what's taking place at the ventricle. In this period of time, the ventricle is relaxed, and that kind of makes sense. We're trying to fill it, right? The atria is contracting, atrial systole, filling a relaxed, a diastolic ventricle, okay? Then, from there on out, the atria is in diastole. It relaxes the rest of the time. It's willing to fill with blood returning from the venous system. Here we see the ventricles actually contracting, so ventricular systole, in order to push blood out to the lungs or the body. And then notice half of this time in the cardiac cycle, both chambers are relaxed, right? And so that's blood can flow into the atria and just by gravity drop right down uh, into the ventricles, and then we start over. The atria contract, the ventricles contract. Filling, atria contract, ventricle contract. That is the cardiac cycle. That's essentially how our two pumps work here in unison. Again, the two pumps are the two ventricles, the right side and the left side, pumping at the same time. I love this. I wish I could slow it down, um, but we want to talk a little bit about valves. In order for this pump to work efficiently, this pump being the heart, we need to make sure that blood is not flowing backwards at any time. And so we use a series of four different valves to make that work. The valve that we see here is actually between the atria and a ventricle, right? And so as the atria contracts, blood is pushed into the ventricle. But then when the ventricle contracts, we want that blood to go to the pulmonary trunk or the aorta, right, depending on the side of the heart. We don't want any going back into the atria. That would be a backflow. And so you see this little valve squeezing shut to protect to prevent that. So as we look at the valves, right, in the heart we have four different valves. Two of them are preventing backflow into the atria, and two of them are preventing backflow from blood vessels, from arteries, into the ventricles. Let's start with the atrioventricular valves. Okay, I love this one because it tells you exactly what it is, right? It's a valve between the atria and the ventricles, right? And so that's what we're seeing over here, atria, ventricle. We have these flaps of tissue that separate them. Now these flaps allow blood to flow down, but then when the ventricle contracts, notice any blood pushing up this way, right, is kind of, they're like little doors, they're swinging shut, okay? So you have a right atrioventricular valve, you can abbreviate that, the right AV valve, okay, and you have a left AV valve. Okay. Um, a couple other things with these, um, anatomically, it's kind of interesting, so like a swinging door, 
but to keep them from swinging backwards, you actually have these like tethers um, that anchor the valve down into the ventricle. So you have what are called chordae tendinae, and that is attached to a papillary muscle, actual muscle down in the ventricle that can contract and hold those valves shut. So the atrioventricular valves have chordae tendinae, and papillary muscles to anchor them, to keep the valves from swinging through backwards. Now, just to keep things interesting, um, there are a couple other terms used here. So here they're showing you both of those valves open, blood going from the atria to the ventricles. Here we see those valves closed. Now notice on the right side here, we see three separate flaps on the valve. On the left-hand side, there's only two. So on the right-hand side, a lot of people call this the tricuspid. I find that people who are already in the field are EMTs and stuff, that is what they know this is, the tricuspid valve and the bicuspid valve, right? And sometimes you'll see people call this left AV valve the mitral valve. So if you've heard of that, it's what they're referring to. Isn't that a fun three names for one anatomical structure? You can call it whatever you want. You should probably recognize all three of them because they are um, actually all, I would say, widely used. Okay? Um, so that is our atrioventricular valves. Right? So that accounts for two of our valves. We also have what are called semilunar valves. Two of those. Okay, these semilunar valves you can kind of see in these pictures. That one's better. Um, they look like little, um, like a t-shirt pocket, right? If you picture like the little pocket. Um, so when blood is trying to flow back into the ventricles, right? Say out of the aorta, as blood kind of sags back down the aorta and wants to go into the ventricle, these little t-shirt pockets fill up right, and push together, and that's going to prevent the backflow. But when the ventricle contracts and is trying to push blood out to the aorta or the pulmonary trunk, notice it just pushes those wide open, right? So just like a t-shirt pocket, you could slide up one way, but you might get caught if you were coming down the other way. That would be closing the valve, okay? Um, you have a semilunar valve, uh, a um, pulmonary, semilunar valve, and your book really just calls it the pulmonary valve, totally fine with that. Um, that is going to be from the right ventricle up into the pulmonary trunk, right, separating those. So the pulmonary valve, let's just say, prevents backflow. Into the right ventricle or if it's easier to think about, it's separating, it's preventing backflow from this pulmonary trunk into the right ventricle. There's your valve, right? Blood can go up, but can't come back down, okay? Um, and then you also have an aortic semilunar valve or aortic valve. It's really hard to see in this picture. Notice it's preventing backflow into the left ventricle. Blood is coming up, right? We want it to go into the aorta. The valve is kind of hidden here, okay? prevents backflow into the left ventricle. Okay, so those are the valves. All right, a little more anatomy before we move on to the physiology. So this image, which I pulled from another textbook, is trying to show you the coronary circulation. And these are the blood vessels that we see in this picture actually feeding the heart itself. Now, this can be a little confusing. You're thinking, well, here's this giant organ. It's hollow on the inside. It's full of blood. Why don't we just use that blood? Remember, the heart is beating constantly, right? It has huge 
aerobic demands for nutrients and oxygen, and recall that diffusion, right, that blood inside of the heart, it can really only feed cells that are like one or two cells away. So we really do need a branching set of arteries, right, breaking down into tiny little capillaries to deliver the oxygen and the nutrients to every single cell in this organ. So what we're gonna see here is really, right, that the heart takes care of itself. Here's the aorta, right? So all that oxygenated blood in the left ventricle, when that left ventricle contracts and it's shooting blood out of the aorta, notice right at the base of the aorta is where these coronary arteries come off, right? We're not waiting till the blood gets down somewhere, you know, in the abdomen and then send a vessel up. No, right away. We're serious about getting oxygen to this organ. So really you have two branches here, the left coronary artery and the right coronary artery. Let's follow the left first. The left coronary artery um, is going to have two main branches. Here we see kind of wrapping around the left hand side of the heart is a branch called the circumflex artery. And then this other branch is what's called the left anterior descending artery or anterior interventricular. I know, two names, isn't it lovely? Uh, let's see, so left anterior descending artery or it's also sometimes called the anterior interventricular. artery. Okay? And so this is, these branches are really feeding kind of the left hand side of the heart. Over off of the right coronary artery, okay, we're also going to have two branches. For some reason this picture doesn't list both of them. The one that kind of wraps around uh, the right hand side is called the marginal, and this is not shown, is the marginal artery. And then the main branch, and this was difficult, they're trying to show you that it's these dotted lines, they're trying to show you that it's like wrapping around the back, right, and feeding here, and that is the posterior descending, right, or interventricular artery. Posterior descending artery or posterior interventricular interventricular. Right. This is going to supply the heart with blood and then we also have a whole set of veins then that are going to collect this blood. Um, uh, again, not showing up on this picture, uh, these cardiac veins, they're going to kind of bring the blood in. It all joins on the back and dumps into uh, that coronary sinus that we saw in the right atrium. You'll get to see this a little bit better um, on the models in lab. These vessels, right, since they are in charge of taking um, all this blood to the heart, right, really supplying it with all its needs, um, we want them to be wide open, right, free from any clogs, blockages, obstructions. Um, but what we'll see, if you're familiar with atherosclerosis, right, hardening of the arteries. That's what we see here in these images, these plaques forming and really over time very much constricting uh, blood flow through these arteries and of course um, at the end stage of, of this um, you can actually cut off blood flow. That would give someone a myocardial infarction or heart attack, right? Part of that heart tissue is going ischemic, right? It's not getting blood um, and that heart muscle is going to die. That's bad. Okay, so um, anatomically, right, just the placement of the heart should tell you maybe a little bit about its importance as well. So here we see the heart located in the center of the thoracic cavity, right, the whole thoracic cavity. Um, we refer to that kind of central area, right, we have two pleural cavities where the lungs are located. Um, the mediastinum is where you'll find the heart. And it's very well protected here, right? It's right behind the sternum, 
the ribs are wrapping around to protect it. It's got a long one either side uh, protecting it. And then it's also in its own little sac, which is the pericardium. So let's look at a little bit about the uh, structure of the heart and some of those protections. So here um, we are looking at the layers of the heart, right? So we're zoomed in on this little slice. And so let's take a look from the inside out, right? The endocardium. is this innermost layer of the heart. This is what's actually gonna be touching the blood inside all of those chambers. And notice it's really just made up of endothelium, which is a simple squamous epithelium. And we will use that endothelium. Oh yeah, we saw this in, uh, when we were talking about platelets in the coagulation phase, right? So the specialized name for simple squamous epithelium. Right, and then a little bit of areolar connective tissue as well. That's the endocardium. Now, most of the actual heart wall, right, the heart is made up of um, myocardium. Okay, myo meaning muscle. So if you remember um, myoglobin, maybe from when you were in skeletal muscle, um, or if you've heard of myofascial release, right? Myo meaning muscle. This is the actual muscular wall. It's going to do the contracting, going to do the pumping, right? We'll talk about the cardiac muscle cells um, and then they're held together with connective tissue. So this um, myocardium is actually arranged in kind of this spiral um, setup. This is gonna make it more efficient at kind of ringing the blood out of the heart. And there's actually um, <clears throat> what they refer to as a cardiac skeleton. It's kind of these bands of connective tissue that help anchor um, the myocardium in this particular uh, format. Okay. And then, sorry, last but not least, um, the outer layer is referred to as the pericardium. Sorry, and so this is cardiac muscle, and then the uh, epicardium. Um, sorry, and I said pericardium because they're interchangeable um, in some ways. So the epicardium is just this outer layer. Um, again, it's going to be simple squamous epithelial cells. In this case, it's lining a cavity. So now we call it mesothelium, not endothelium. Um, but epicardium is synonymous with visceral pericardium. So it is a mesothelium. Again, just simple squamous epithelium, but lining a cavity. Um, and epicardium is the same as saying visceral pericardium. Now, the pericardium, when we think about that layer, we think about the sac that the heart sits in. And so notice here, they're talking about the parietal pericardium. Let's look at the pericardium as a whole here. So again, the pericardium is gonna be this kind of sac that the heart is sitting in. And it has multiple layers. And so that's what makes this language um, a little bit more complicated. So, what you'll see here is, notice they're showing you this little space here. What we'll find is the layers of the pericardium are secreting a serous fluid. It's a fluid with um, some glycolipids in there that makes it a little bit smooth. And this is gonna help the really, if we think about the function of the pericardium, it's to have this little bit of slippery substance between the heart and those surrounding organs. Every time the heart beats, right, 100,000 times a day, you don't want it rubbing on a rib or the sternum or something like that. And so it sits in this pericardial sac, which decreases um, the friction there. So the pericardium is double layered. You have a visceral pericardium. which is the actual surface of the heart, right? That is the 
at the field, uh, epicardium that we were just talking about here, right? Same as visceral pericardium. And then we also have the parietal pericardium. Now, you will see this terminology in other um, sacs surrounding organs. So like when we get to the respiratory system, we will talk about the pleura. That's the sac surrounding the lungs. There's a visceral pleura and a parietal pleura. So get used to this terminology. Visceral is always the one touching the organ, right? Think viscera or like if you eviscerate someone, right? You slice them down the middle and their organs <laughs> fall out. So the viscera, the organs, that's the layer that's at, like the surface of the organ. Parietal then um, is surrounding it, okay? And I really like this image, right? So if you think about the pericardium, this is just like doubled over on itself, um, but you have the same uh, kind of tissue here. Both are producing that serous fluid. We would call that pericardial fluid. To decrease friction. Okay, now the parietal pleura also has this very thick fibrous layer um, on the outside, and I'm just going to say with fibrous layer. Sometimes you'll see that called the fibrous pericardium, um, but it's really part of this parietal pericardium and it helps to anchor um, that to surrounding tissues, right?